We've been awarded the B&Q Neighbourly Grant, which is something that they look for a local charity to support, and B&Q, just around the corner, we're building a great partnership with them, which is lovely. They chose us to send some staff to, to do some work with us. So we had five staff come over two days, um, is this part of their charity thing, and I don't know if you've noticed, but we have some new planters. We had a £1,000 worth of materials and plants that was part of this grant, and they did some lovely herb planters outside the front doors, which which the cafe will be using. Um, they landscaped the front and we had new planters. And yeah, it was just lovely to host that team. Um, and then obviously the next day we had to ring them, Kim did, and say, uh, we've got lots of cars on your car park. Are you OK? But they're really fine with that. So that was really good. So that was another special thing. Right, All Wrapped Up is launching. <laughs> if you don't know what All Wrapped Up is, there's a little video we're going to show you. Have a Hello and welcome to All Wrapped Up 2022. We are very excited and we just wanted to show you a video of our auditorium and what it's turned into, our winter wonderland. So the parents and the carers will come in uh, and they'll be choosing presents for their children. And this is the 0 to 3 table. They'll choose a present from there. Or if they've got a child that's a bit older, they'll move through the ages. And you can see there's lots of Lego and older toys and they will choose one from here, um, whatever they think suits their child. Lots of beautiful things that have been donated. And then on this table, this is like an extra table with slippers, lots of Paw Patrol slippers, um, and some brand new clothes that we've been donated. Um, so if they've got young children, they can take one of these. These are extras. And then over here in this corner, um, we've actually got a little pet table, which has been donated to us from a vet. So, yeah, if they've got a pet, they can take a little present for their dog or cat. And then we have two stocking filler tables in the middle. Again, these are extras, so there's probably enough for two stocking filler presents each per child that are coming. So this one or this table that's the same. And they can choose from there. We've got our lovely Christmas trees twinkling on the stage. Make it look like a wonderful forest. And then over here we have got fleecy blankets and woolly hats so this is like the warm area every child we've got hundreds of these every child will be able to have a fleecy blanket to take home with them and then here we've got the teenage presents and adult presents so every adult that comes will be able to choose a couple of presents for themselves just to to bless themselves really and then over here we've got a little book table there's enough for every child to have a book too and a chocolate table, all of this will be replenished as the days go. And then over here, they can then come and have them wrapped. The presents, everything they've chosen can be wrapped and put in big bags and taken home. Or if they don't want to have it wrapped here, they can take some wrapping paper home. But yeah, this is all wrapped up 2022. Amazing job by all the team. Can't wait for it to start in the morning. That was all, all wrapped up 2022, but we didn't only do that. It was a phenomenal couple of days, but we also, so we had 320 referred children came, uh, their parents or carers came, and we had 320 children that were chosen presents for. But we also did um, 280 hamper bags. That's a kind of a separate thing as well as all of that present. So this year we're going big again. Sean had a meeting with the head teachers of all the schools and they all were so grateful for the way it had impacted um, their, this was a couple of weeks ago, their children in their schools and were so enthusing about it. His job was to go and kind of sell it to them, but they all remembered. And he got a round of applause at the end of his little presentation. Um, and each school in her Bay and Whitstable area are doing a non-school uniform day um, in a few weeks time and all the process, proceeds is coming to all wrapped up to fund this because the whole project costs about £25,000 in total so you know that's with the food that's just a rough estimate of what it, the project costs not to Riverside obviously but the whole cost of everything that's donated so we're going out to businesses and the community um, you should see a little article coming out in the Whitstable magazine soon if you live in the Whitstable area 
Um, but we really need your support. We've got lots of support going on. We've got a meeting with the Flows this week because we're launching it with them because they're the people that refer with social workers and health visitors. But we need your help. We need you to buy presents if you can or a present. And as Doug was saying, uh, him and Pauline went on a massive haul and Tesco have their sale on, but actually quite a few of them do now. Argos do and I think Morrison's and they're all kind of coming on with this 50% sale or even more than that. So we're asking you to, if you can, and buy a present for a child up to the age of 17, up to the value of £20. We've got our flyers. These are on the information wall. So if you can't remember all of this and you want to take a flyer, or you know people that might be interested in helping us, if you don't want to buy a present, you can also donate online. As I said, the cost is huge, and we do have to buy a lot of presents ourselves to fill in the blanks. Um, but if you want to donate, there's a QR code, or you can put money in an envelope and mark it all wrapped up. Um, but that's the code to give online. I think it's through the website as well. So there's lots of ways that you can help us. And I know it feels like we're constantly asking you, so just do what you can. Listen to the Lord and respond. You might be out and think, oh, I'm going to pick up that present with my weekly shop. As I said, the big supermarkets are all got their sales on now because they're trying to push the Christmas present. So take a flyer, spread the word, and pray for all of us as we prepare to launch this and to do it in December. On the 12th and 13th of December, it's going to be um, because we think it'll be bigger than ever this year. So thank you for all your support and yeah, be praying for us. I think that's me. Yeah. yeah. Let's welcome Simon. Well done. A lot going on. There's a lot going on as ever. So we're, um, we're coming into land on our MOVE series today, uh, God's Heart of Compassion. So we're going to do a final talk. So far, we've looked at these, um, what I could class as radiating circles of compassion. We started looking at self-compassion, how important that is to show kindness to ourselves. Then we looked at compassion in the church, showing compassion and kindness to our church family. And then Jake, look, last week, looked at that compassion radiating out and extending to our neighbours and friends and those around us. And I want to look at today how we can kind of really focus on being these kind of compassion carriers when this has finished, when this series has finished. How do we continue to be people of compassion? I want to tell you a bit of a story. I haven't got time to read through um, some big chunks of scripture today, but I'm going to kind of take, give you an appraise of Matthew 14, 15, and 16, and then we're going to land in a section which I think is really important when it relates to compassion. In chapter 14, we read that Jesus has just heard about the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. John had been imprisoned for speaking out against Herod. Herod had basically taken his, 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 uh, his brother's wife, uh, Herodias, um, and uh, John had spoken out against this, and so Herod had imprisoned him. But Herod was scared that the reputation John had was too strong to execute him, so John was languishing in prison. And you read in the Gospels, John sending messages to try and figure out whether Jesus is the Messiah, is the one who is to come. And then Herod gets forced into executing John. He uh, is trapped. Herodias' daughter dances before Herod, and Herod is so enamored that he promises her anything she requests. And Herodias spots an opportunity and whispers in her ear, ask for John's head on a platter. And so uh, what can Herod do? He's publicly, he can't back down. He, he decides to go through and have Herod executed, so that's the end, sorry, John executed, and that's the end of John the Baptist. Now, Jesus hears this uh, news, and uh, he decides to publicly retreat. It says in Matthew's Gospel, he wants to go to a solitary, private place, obviously to grieve the loss of his cousin. But when they cross the lake, they land on the shore, and a huge crowd has figured out where they're going and followed them round the shoreline. And so when Jesus is about to land, there's a huge crowd of people waiting for him. Now, Jesus could have legitimately said, go away, I'm grieving. You know, go away, I, I need to grieve the loss and death of my cousin. But he doesn't. Matthew's Gospel says that he has compassion on them. He sees them harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, Matthew records. And so he's moved in his heart to put aside his own needs temporarily, and he lands on the shore and begins to heal their sick. There's so many of them. Uh, the gospel records 5,000 men plus women and children. Sorry again, ladies, but you don't count in the numbers because it was a male-centric, again, society. But there could have been 10,000 people there, couldn't there? I mean, men, women, and children. It could have been a huge crowd. 
And Jesus says to the disciples, you need to feed them. And obviously they don't know how to. And they have this miraculous story of Jesus multiplying loaves and fish to feed probably a crowd of maybe 10,000 people entirety. And there's so much abundance of food. There's 12 baskets of leftovers they collect up when everyone's had their fill. Then Jesus dismisses his disciples and he goes onto a mountainside to pray and probably to grieve, probably to find a, a way to recapture the time that's been lost when he's been ministering to the crowd. He goes onto this solitary place on the mountainside and sends the disciples off across the lake on their own. And they have a hard time of it because a storm blows up and they're buffeted by the wind and the waves. And Jesus decides to make up lost time by walking out on the water to meet them. And that's what you need to do if you want to maximize your diary. You need to walk on water. That's a way to make up for lost time. That's what Jesus does. He walks out on the water to meet them, catch up with them. And they think he's a ghost in the early morning mist, but he's not. He's Jesus. And we have Peter's famous attempt at walking on water, which doesn't end well. And uh, Jesus puts him back in the boat. And they land on the other sh- back on the other shore. Meantime, a huge crowd again has worked out where they are and uh, has figured out, uh, and they meet them again. They meet this huge crowd of people. This time, Matthew's Gospel records around possibly 4,000 people plus women and children. So again, maybe a crowd twice that size. What happens again? Jesus ministers to them, he teaches them, and then the disciples have to feed them again. This time, they multiply a few more loaves and fishes. Again, there's an abundance of leftovers. I think Matthew records seven basketfuls this time of leftovers once everyone has had their fill. These are two prominent compassion encounters in the life of Jesus. Then the Pharisees show up and the Sadducees show up. And Matthew says they've come to test Jesus at the start of Matthew chapter 16. Now what's interesting is the Pharisees and the Sadducees absolutely hated each other. They believed very different things and they hated each other. So if you think of a modern kind of interpretation, it's like Millwall and West Ham fans turning up together <laughs> to decide to confront somebody. Their hatred was deep. They were, they were opponents of each other. They held, different, they held religious power, but they interpreted it different ways, and they approached it different ways. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection after death, and the Sadducees firmly didn't believe. Um, but there's a phrase, isn't there? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so these two groups had decided that Jesus was such a threat to both of their influential power positions, religious positions, they would come together to try and trap him and to try and test him. And so they ask him to show them a sign from heaven to demonstrate that he really is who he says he is. Is he authentically from God? They're just trying to trap him. If he shows them a sign... They can publicly accuse him of just being like a performer, doing things, you know, on request. If he doesn't show them a sign, then they can accuse him of being a fake and not being authentic. But Jesus calls them out. He doesn't fall for the trap. He says his authenticity is as obvious as looking at the sky to determine what the weather's like. He said, and the only sign you're going to get from me, Jesus says, is the sign of Jonah. And he doesn't even explain that. But they would be familiar with the story of Jonah, And they would know that Jonah had been in the belly of a fish for three days. And this is obviously alluding to Jesus' time in the tomb. This is going to come at a later time. But he doesn't explain that anymore. He just says, no one will be given to you apart from the sign of Jonah. And then once more, they get back in the boat and go back across the lake. And this is where we're going to pick the story up in Matthew 16, beginning of the chapter there. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this amongst themselves and said, is it because we didn't bring any bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they're crossing the lake, and they suddenly realize they forgot to take food with them, namely bread. And uh, it's playing on their minds. 
It's playing on their minds. And then Jesus says this, be careful, you know, be on your guard against this yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, yeast is obviously used to make bread. So straight away, their minds go to bread and physical bread. And they think that Jesus is having a go at them for forgetting to bring bread with them. Perhaps they should have saved some of those leftovers and not been left short of bread. Jesus hears this conversation about bread and he says to them, he says, you of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? He reminds them they've just seen two incredibly miraculous events, one where thousands of people were fed and 5,000 plus and then another event where 4,000 plus were fed and all the basketfuls of leftovers were gathered up and he's like, how on earth are you worried about food? How on earth are you thinking you should be worried about food? You can hear the exasperation in Jesus' words here. You see me feed 5,000 with five loaves, and you see me feed 4,000 with seven loaves, and now you're worried about having no food for lunch as we cross the lake. Not only that, how much was left over on both occasions? 12 baskets the first time, seven baskets the second time. The last thing you need to be worried about with Jesus is running out of food. That's why he's trying to tell them. The last thing you need to be worried about is running out of bread. But what you do need to be worried about, he says, is be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, Jesus had used the analogy of yeast before. He'd used it in a positive way to describe the kingdom of God. He used it in, in, a, in a parable. He said the yeast, the kingdom of God is like yeast that a woman took and worked it through a huge batch of dough, 60 pounds of dough, and this small amount of yeast worked all the way through the dough and had an impact and caused that dough to, uh, to change, to be transformed. He just used the yeast to describe the invasive nature of the kingdom, the fact that a little bit of yeast goes a long way and brings a big change. Yeast, as you know, causes carbon dioxide and causes bread to rise, and so the yeast in the bread has a massive impact on the outcome of the sort of bread that you're going to eat. So he's used the analogy of yeast before, but this time he's using yeast in a different kind of way. He's describing yeast that is attributed to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Mark's account of the same story, Jesus says this. He says, Be careful, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Herod are all carrying the same kind of yeast. Now, theologians and commentators have tried to figure out what this yeast is for years, and they can't give you, or me, a definitive answer, okay? They can't say this exactly is what Jesus was referring to. But what we can unpack here is there's something that these people are carrying that basically is having a negative impact on the kingdom of God. The only, the only semi-definition we have is in Luke's gospel where Jesus says the yeast of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Pretend to be one thing when in fact you're something else. Now what on earth has all this got to do with compassion? <clears throat> you're asking. Just an introduction this is. What's it all got to do with compassion? Well, the reason I wanted to bring this story to you today is because what we have in this story is a clash of cultures. A clash of two different cultures. We've got a culture that's being carried by Jesus, and we've got a culture that's being carried by the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and by Herod. Two different cultures. So let's look at them. Jesus carries a culture of the kingdom. That culture is primarily a culture of compassion. That's the culture that Jesus carries. Wherever he goes, even when he's set aside time to grieve for his cousin, he's still carrying compassion. And so when he sees a crowd that's harassed and helpless, he's moved to help them. The Pharisees and Sadducees and Herod carry a culture that is self-serving, a culture that primarily is focused on the self, what can be gained for the self. The reason they were threatened by Jesus is Jesus was undermining their power base. <coughs> The power base they spent a long time basically building that self-serves. It was, it was actually focused in on themselves and their own welfare. These three had collaborated together, even though they were sworn enemies, to destroy 
Jesus, to destroy what he carried, the culture that he carried. These two cultures, or yeasts, basically vie for influence in our lives. Even though the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod aren't around anymore, that self-serving yeast is still vying for space in your life. In the same way that if you're basically a follower of Jesus, the yeast of the kingdom, the yeast of compassion, is also vying for space in your life. The yeast of the kingdom, it wants to expand us and change us and transform us. It wants to make us more like Jesus. Jesus used all these analogies, didn't he, and parables about things growing and expanding and changing as the kingdom of God came to them. He talked about plants, he talked about yeast, he talked about wineskins, he talked about all these different ways of describing what happens when God comes and begins to work in our lives and essentially kind of inflates us with his love and grace. The kingdom yeast, it kind of turns us outward and upward. It turns us towards God and it turns us towards people. It's an expanding thing. The self-serving yeast, represented by the Pharisees and Sadducees and Herod, actually does the reverse. It contracts us. It turns us in on ourselves. It makes us selfish. It makes us self-serving. It contracts us, and it begins to kill and poison the spirituality in our lives. So Jesus said, be on your guard. Watch out against this kind of yeast. Watch out, be on your guard against this kind of self-serving yeast. Anybody watch the uh, post-apocalyptic show, The Last of Us? A few of you. It's quite a dramatic show. It's quite a hard-hitting show. But the essence of the show is it tells the story of the uh, cordyceps fungus, which manages to jump, a fungus that normally infects insects, manages to jump and actually begin to affect humans. This is the fungus that normally actually is actually a very real fungus. It zombifies ants. So basically it gets into an ant, it makes an ant act a certain way, and basically all the, all the fungus does, it makes the, the ant act in a way that serves the fungus. So the ant basically acts in a very strange way, even to the point of climbing to the top of a piece of grass, which an ant would never do because it would be exposed to predators, so the spores of the cordyceps could spread far and wide. So the idea behind this fictional, <laughs> thankfully, fictional program is that cordyceps has got into the grain supply of the world, a bit like yeast, and basically suddenly is propagated throughout the whole of humankind. The last of us refers to the last of humanity that basically have managed to avoid being uh, impacted by this fungus. I found real parallels actually watching this um, because of the, uh, the impact of things actually in our lives. The characters in The Last of Us, they wear gas masks to try and avoid being infected I won't tell you any more in case you want to watch the series. It's pretty hard-hitting, so it may not be everyone's taste. Uh, but the question is, what do we do to guard ourselves, as Jesus suggested, against the yeasts that are present in our world, in our society, in our culture? Jesus didn't say ignore the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees or Herod. He said, be on your guard against, watch out for, be aware, is what Jesus said. And I think that's really important. The first thing we need to be is be a people that, that are aware that the stuff in our culture, in our environment, in the things that we watch, the things we give our attention to, the things that we listen to, the things that we maybe do habitually, that basically will be having a negative impact on our spiritual life. That yeast is looking to grow and change us in the same way that the kingdom yeast is. So... Have a think about it for a moment the diet of things that are in your life. Are they serving you? Are they making you or helping you become more compassionate, more Christ-like? Or are they having a negative effect? Are they contracting you away from God? Because Jesus said we need to be actively resisting those things. Actively resisting. Be on your guard against. So we need to watch out for them and be aware of them. And I think the other side of this equation is that we need to be active in partnering with the things of God. Actively being on our guard and actively partnering with the, the work of the Spirit in our lives. 
Jesus rebuked the disciples because all they were focused on was their perceived lack of bread. Their whole world, world had kind of collapsed into their stomachs and they were worried they hadn't got enough bread. And Jesus said, look around. You're missing the bigger picture of the kingdom. Open your eyes. They'd seen Jesus enacting compassion on a huge scale twice in a couple of days. And they still were focusing in on the minor things, on the small things, on the negative things. They were operating from their old mindsets. In Mark's account of the story, you get a much fuller picture of Jesus' exasperation with them. He says this, he says, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? You can imagine Jesus sort of knocking his head and going, guys, you know, look what you've just seen, look what you've just heard, what you've just witnessed, you know, and yet you're focusing in on this stuff. The disciples still weren't letting the kingdom activity of God land in their hearts and change their outlook. They still were resistant to things of the kingdom. That yeast of the kingdom has to land and actively work in us to bring transformation and change. So they're seeing but not seeing, they're hearing but not hearing, they're failing to understand and they don't remember. It's quite a damning indictment from Jesus. And you can see humanly how exasperated he must have been. You know, what must I do to demonstrate the kingdom to you? you know, what must I do to bring change? So as we come into land on this series, guys, I just want to encourage you, we don't passively change. We don't just passively become more like Jesus. We don't just passively become more, we don't carry us of compassion. We, there's this, this activity and action, intention that we need to be people of. We need to be people on our guard against the things that are going to contract us and be act, active in partnering with the things that are going to expand us and, and make us more like Jesus. And so often as Christians, we just kind of go along on this conveyor belt of life. We need to be more active. We need to be more aware. We need to be more intentional. And these things will look different for every one of you. What it looks like to be intentional, what it looks like to set your heart on being a compassion carrier will look different for each one of us. But the, the key thing is you need to be actively participating in what God wants to do in your life and actively resisting cultural things that aren't helping you uh, be transformed into the, into the likeness of Christ. So making sure that we see and really see, making sure that we hear and really hear, making sure we have some understanding and making sure we remember. Those are the things that Jesus brought to the disciples' attention. And then the yeast of the kingdom that is coming to you isn't lost. It finds a space to land, it finds a space to grow and bring change and transformation. And then we can become these compassion carriers, I think, across all these different spheres, all these different interactions that we have with different people in different places. We can be people who carry compassion into these spaces. If you're able, why don't you stand with me?